Good afternoon, and welcome to an interactive conversation with faculty. I'm Leslie York, and with me today is Kathy Hodge, a faculty member who focuses on fungi. Welcome, Kathy. Hi, Leslie. It is great to have you here, and great to be in Mann Library's gallery, surrounded by an exhibit that you organized about fungi. I know, isn't it great? I love it. It's beautiful. And there's some creepy crawlies in here, and there's some beautiful pictures, and I'm sure there are a lot of stories to tell. They're all beautiful to me. Yeah. <laughs> so tell me, what brought you to this place? Oh, that's a long story. How far back can we go? You know, good stories start with long ago and far away. <laughs> okay, so when I was a little girl, I used to look at everything small with a hand lens that my father gave me. And I, so I spent a lot of summers crawling around in the undergrowth looking at tiny things. And there was this one thing that I found that looked like a little orange finger. And it was attached, if you yanked it up, it was attached to a brown bullet. And it was a baffling thing. I couldn't figure it out for the longest time. But it turned out that the bullet was actually the pupa of a moth. So that stage between caterpillar and flying moth. That's right. Okay. So it was, a it was a busy changing inside that little bullet shaped thing. And the orange finger sticking up was actually a fungus that only eats moths. <laughs> it was killing that little moth. And so as a child, I got very fascinated by that thing. And I forgot about it for many years until I got to college and took courses in everything small and got really inspired by fungi from my, my college professor. Mm. So um, you are now a fifth generation mycologist at Cornell. That means four other generations of people who study mushrooms and yeast and mold mm -hmm. have preceded you. That's right. They created a collection which is called? It's the Cornell Plant Pathology Herbarium. Mm. And it's a big collection. We have hundreds of thousands of samples of fungi preserved over the last 125 years. It's kind of a storehouse of fungal biodiversity. Hmm. And so what do you use the um, herbarium for? Well, I mean, it's a storehouse of biodiversity. So it documents some um, fungi in the world over the last century or so. And um, we act as kind of a, a lending library so, so you can dial up and get mushrooms in the mail? Yeah, kind of. If you're a scientist, you can. Oh, okay. uh, we don't. They're all dead and preserved, mm -hmm. and, but we, um, they're really important scientifically. Mm -hmm. Some of them are the first of their kind ever described. Mm -hmm. Actually, about 7,000 of them are those. So when I was looking at the exhibit earlier, I saw that there are index cards with that beautiful sort of calligraphy handwriting and fading ink. How do you make a collection like this available to you know, a world that is global? Yeah, um, well, that's a good question, and that's a, a very frustrating thing to do. We've been doing that over the last three years, uh, bringing our information about our collections into the modern age by actually digitizing all the, the uh, information about the specimens. Mm -hmm. And it does, it's very challenging to take handwriting, and somebody has to type that in. Oh my goodness. But the result of that is that we can look at our collection data in a new way. So mm -hmm. we used to have to leaf through index catalog cards, mm -hmm. very tedious. But now if you ask me what fungi fruited on July 1st um, over the last 100 years, I can tell you it's very powerful. That is powerful. And I mean, so data and information is really powerful. But one of the things that you told me is that the reason that you love mushrooms so much is that they are, have overlooked stories. Sorry, mushrooms, fungi, molds. yeast, molds. Their stories are overlooked. Uh -huh. And um, tell me how you help to tell those stories now. I guess I feel like I'm kind of a champion of fungi. I, I think they're so fascinating. And it's amazing to me that people don't know much about them. Mm. Um, so so um, through the herbarium work and some outreach I do, but also the Cornell Mushroom blog, we like to tell the stories that fungi can't tell on their own. So I, you did tell me a story about a, a Cornelian who actually ate a deadly mushroom and mm -hmm. survived. He survived. He did. Um, what kind of mushroom was that? Uh, it's a mushroom called the Destroying Angel. The Destroying Angel. Really, don't eat anything yeah. called the Destroying Angel. Yeah, but out in the wild, how would I know that it was a Destroying Angel? Well, that's the problem. Yeah. So, um, but back to storytelling um, with the mushroom blog. I understand that you and your students both do some posting. And mm -hmm. um, your most recent post is about 
fungi that grow, grew on the poop of extinct woolly mammoths. That extinct woolly mammoth's poop. Mushroom. It's a compelling story already. It is isn't a compelling it? story already, but <laughs> how do you know that that's what you're looking at? And where do you find this? Well, one of my students wrote this post. It's really fine. Okay. So it's on the mushroom blog right now. <laughs> um, but the, the basics are that if you want to know uh, where woolly mammoths were in the world, mm -hmm. uh, it's hard to find a woolly mammoth, even though they're very large. Mm -hmm. But they left behind a lot of poo. However, the poo tends to turn into something like soil. Mm. So we can find where the poo was by finding the spores of the fungi that live in the poo. Am I just embarrassing myself here? You are this not embarrassing yourself, but I mean, how do you know what, that when you're seeing a, a spore? I understand they're smaller than we can see with the naked eye. Yeah, fungal spores are very small, and you probably fit a hundred of them in a millimeter. Um, so you need a microscope to find them. And do you take one uh, microscope out into the field? You can. Or you bring the poo but, back to your lab? Yeah, more often. Okay. Yeah. Mycologists are notorious for studying poo for some reason. Well, you know, it makes for a good story. I guess so. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I understand that um, there are fungus who have a particular attraction to other kinds of insects, and we are currently in the midst of the um, cicada invasion on the eastern coast here. Yeah. Um, are there any fungi who like them in particular? <laughs> How did you know? <laughs> because you told me. <laughs> but it's a great story. Well, another student of mine wrote a fine post on the Cornell Mushroom blog about uh, fungi that kill cicadas. But mm -hmm. they kill cicadas in a really creative kind of way. They don't just kill them, they actually eat their butts off. And then, so then you have live cicadas flying around that have no butt, but trickling out of where their butt should be are spores that can infect other cicadas. Okay, so we have cicadas, buttless cicadas <laughs> flying around, dribbling spores, yeah. and they fall on oh, other cicadas? Yeah, so then the more cicadas get sick. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Later in the season, um, the cicadas that get sick toward the end of the season, they don't do the dribbly butt thing. They, in, they instead develop spores that fall to the soil, and those spores wait there for 17 years until the next batch of cicadas emerges, and somehow they sense them and get them. It is amazing to me. And one of the things that you had talked about was just how um, the students that you love to work with best are the ones who just love nature, who yeah. just, you know, want to figure things out. So um, I know that you uh, teach two courses mm -hmm. in this area, and uh, one on mushrooms and one on fungi. Oh my gosh, you got to help me here. Yeah, well, it's called medical and veterinary mycology. So it's fungal diseases of people and animals. So everything from yeast infections, athlete's foot, to fungi that can eat your face off, basically. And we, I know it's, it's disgusting, it's, horribly it, disgusting. Mm -hmm. There's something compelling about things that are horribly disgusting. But um, it's important mm -hmm. because some of these diseases are quite deadly and we don't know much about them. My students are, you know, want to become doctors and veterinarians, mm -hmm. so yeah. Wow. That's, that, uh, it's mind boggling. Um, so one of the things that uh, we do in this series of ours is to open up um, and take some questions from our audience. And some of those questions have come in ahead. Uh -huh. And so I'd like to just see what's on our screen here. Okay, yeah. Okay. No Remember, math questions. No math questions. Um, oh, this is interesting. How do fungi help trees? How do fungi help trees? Good question. Well, there's some fungi that kill trees. Just want to put mm -hmm. that out there. But, but underground, um, most trees that live around us are hooked up underground to a fungal symbiont, a partner. Mm. And um, they're very special partners. They feed each other, so the fungus provides nutrients from the soil that the plant couldn't get on its own. And the, fun and the tree donates some of the nutrients it captures from sunlight to the fungus. And without that relationship, we wouldn't have our modern forests. Can you see this network? Is it, is it visible or is it sort of at the microscopic level? It's, it's sort of at the microscopic level, but you can see it because many of our fall mushrooms around here are the fruiting bodies of those secret symbioses. The secret symbioses. Yeah, yeah. 
So some of the best eating mushrooms, the chanterelles, the bolides, mm. those are all tree symbionts. That is so cool. But that leads me to another question. I think, um, so when you mentioned fruiting body, it made me think, so do mushrooms have a flower? Is one of the questions a on A flower, our... do they have a flower? Well, mushrooms are kind of like a flower. They make essentially seeds. Mm -hmm. The whole function of a mushroom is to make spores, which mm -hmm. are like seeds. Mm -hmm. So yeah, kind of like flowers. And, okay, so um, there is another question coming in here. This one I think is, oh, can we go for the gross? Oh, I hate gross. Okay, then I'll go for the serious. No, go for the okay. gross. Um, so what eats fungus? Oh, lots of things. Well, other fungi, for one thing. Uh -huh. That's my favorite. Those mycoparasitic fungi are fungi that eat other fungi. And they're kind of awesome, too. Um, but also lots of bugs and mites and tiny things in soil. Yeah. And people. And people. So people, so your mushroom course teaches people about what mushrooms to eat and what mushrooms not to eat. Yeah. But, um, but there are also um, molds that we eat and molds that we find thoroughly disgusting. Yeah, yeah, so like blue cheese is a is kind of a cheese. delicious kind. You like blue cheese, I right? I love blue cheese. Yeah, brie and camembert are also mold fermented cheeses. They are? On the exterior or on the interior? You know that that powdery white yeah. rind? Well, that's those are fungus spores. They're fungus spores. Mm, tasty, mm, tasty fungus spores. Yeah, delicious. Spores. <laughs> yep. But other fungi that you might find in your kitchen are not so friendly, mm -hmm. and if you ate them, some of them contain toxins that you probably shouldn't eat. So don't eat moldy food unless it's supposed to be moldy. Okay, so if mold grows after I purchase it, if it's not already there, then I shouldn't be eating it. I, yeah, Okay. let's say, yeah. That's safe. All right, so I know that you're also fascinated by the um, everyday molds and fungi that you find, say, in your kitchen. Yeah. And that you're begin uh, just about to start a study on those. Can you tell me about that? Yeah, actually, we're, we're interested in extremophile fungi. So normally you would think extremophiles, you have to go to a deep sea vent or a thermal spring somewhere to find them, right? Mm -hmm. But in fact, there are extremophiles that live right, right in our own homes all the time. Those extremophiles in my home. I'm yes. getting very nervous here. Those dry places, right? The mm -hmm. corner behind the toaster where it's like a desert, but there's crumbs. So there are fungi that live in that environment, yeah. and they're, they're not very well known. Well, you told me earlier that very few, a very small percentage of fungi are actually identified. Yeah. What is that percentage? Oh, it's like such a shocking number that it's hard to even get my head around it, but it's at least, um, at least nine out of 10 fungi don't even have a name yet. Hey, speaking of names. Yeah. Do you have um, any fungi named for you? There's one fungus named after me, yes. yes. It's called Pisoloma cathii. And my predecessor, Dick Korf, named it after me. It's a beautiful little cup fungus that lives in streams. Streams? Yeah. I, I don't know if I've ever seen a mushroom in a stream. But we have a question about somebody from somebody that I think uh, is right on target here. So she says, um, so why do mushrooms grow so fast? I left for work yesterday, and I had a mushroom-free lawn, but I came home to a big batch of fist-sized mushrooms. Ooh, lucky. How is that possible? Oh, well, they're just fast. They, they want to fruit while it's wet, mm -hmm. because mushrooms actually need humidity in the air in order to do the main thing that mushrooms are made for, which is to disperse their spores. So mushrooms that come up in really dry weather have a harder time getting their spores around. Well, there you go, Lisa. That's the answer to your question. Um, another, ah, um, oh, this is interesting. So Nancy asks, can fungi help people stay healthy or fight illness? Yes, yes, and Could I'm Could you not, give maybe an example or? Yeah, well, I'm not an herbalist, but, but there certainly are fungi that are important in herbal medicine, mm -hmm. like um, the reishi mushroom has been used for centuries in Asia. Um, and there are a number of others that grow around here, like the maitake. I think you told me you like maitake mushrooms. I do like maitake That one mushrooms. has some medicinal benefits, too. So yes, Very fungi cool. can do that. So um, Linda wants to know, are there any fungi, speaking of our earlier conversation, that are symbionts with humans? Yeah, that's a really interesting question. Um, 
we're just starting to find out about that. So in fact, the first paper is about the microbiome of humans, the fungi mm -hmm. that live inside us or on us, came out just in the last year or so. But yeah, there's a fungus called Malassezia that most of us, most of us have colonies of Malassezia on us, on our scalp. Sometimes they act up and cause dandruff, but they're just our constant companions. Well, we do know that you know, we are made up of all sorts of other hangers on in our yeah, bodies. Right. So. Well, Kathy, our time is almost up, but uh, one of the things we do at the end of each of these conversations is to ask a question about, as a teacher, as a mentor, what is it that you hope your students will take from their experiences and the classes that they take with you as they move out into the world? Well, I actually, um, in the syllabi from my, my undergraduate courses, I have a goal, and we talk about the goals at the beginning of the course and agree to them. Um, and that goal is um, to be able to tell other people convincingly why fungi are cool. Kathy, you have convinced me that fungi <laughs> are cool. Thank you so much for joining us, Kathy. And thank you, too, for your questions and for sharing this conversation with us. We'll look forward to seeing you next time.